Okinawa Jima was the scene of the last great battle of the Pacific War. The capital and nucleus of the bead-like Ryukyu chain, Okinawa was only 495 miles from the coast of China, 380 miles from Formosa, and 415 miles from Kyushu. It screened the East China Sea, insulated the teeming coastal cities of China, and it was the lock on Japan's southern door. A vital link in the imperial mechanism, Okinawa was the funnel through which the enemy fed and reinforced his embattled fortresses to the south. Japanese aircraft, merchantmen, and fleet units paused at Okinawa's airfields and harbors en route to South China, Malaya, the Indies, and the Carolines. Okinawa and the Ryukyus was the Japanese jugular vein. In American hands, Okinawa would represent the first conquest of Japanese home soil, for this island was an imperial prefecture. In American hands, Okinawa would mean the reduction of Japan from a powerful empire to an isolated land awaiting the shock of invasion. In January and February 1945, carriers of the United States Navy probed the waters of the East China Sea, launching strike after strike against the Ryukyus. Okinawa was the principal target for cameras as well as bombs. Off Okinawa, a fringing reef extended seaward in some places to a distance of 2,500 yards. Behind the reef that girdled the island lay hundreds of miles of unbroken rocky coastline. Naha, once a prosperous port city of 65,000 people, this city had become a constant target and heavily populated. Here, the terrain was undulating and contained small coral hillocks. In central Okinawa, the terrain grew irregular. Wooded foothills, escarpments, and terraces replaced the level country. In the north, mountains rose out of the sea to form a virtually unbroken spine in the interior. On overcrowded, impoverished Okinawa, the people carved their terraces over whole mountains in a desperate effort to exist. Aerial reconnaissance indicated that in the coming operation, space would be an ally of the Japanese. To the United States 10th Army, commanded by Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner, went the mission of landing on and seizing Okinawa Jima. Organized prior to the operation, the 10th Army was composed of the 24th Corps and the 3rd Marine Amphibious Corps. Comprising the 3rd Marine Amphibious Corps was Major General Lemuel C. Shepard, Jr., 6th Marine Division, Major General Pedro Del Valle's 1st Marine Division, and Corps troops. The plan for the initial landing of the 10th Army was as follows. The 6th Marine Division was to land on the green and red beaches which extended generally from a point north of Sobe town to Zampamasaki. The 1st Marine Division was to land on the right of the 6th Marine Division between Sobe town and the Bisha River. The 24th Corps was to land on the right of the 1st Marine Division south of the Bisha River. Yontan Airfield, the enemy's principal fighter base on the island, was the primary objective of the 6th Marine Division. Located on a high plateau less than 2,000 yards inland from the beach, Yontan Airfield would be required as a base for daylight and night fighter marine aviation. Easter Sunday, 1 April 1945, was the day of the landing. It was designated as Love Day. Under ideal sea conditions and covered by naval gunfire, assault battalions of the 4th and 22nd Marines headed for the beaches of Okinawa. Veterans of Macon, Tulagi, Guadalcanal, New Georgia, Bougainville, Emera, Eniwetok, and Guam, these Marines had just completed months of extensive amphibious training in the Lower Solomons. While Colonel Merlin Schneider's 22nd Marines moved shoreward toward the green beaches, Colonel Allen Chapley's 4th Marines headed for the red beaches, from which they could directly assault Yontan Airfield. The beach at Okinawa was different. Landings were virtually unopposed, not only on the green and red beaches, but along the entire 10th Army front. Over the jagged coral and twisted casarina stumps, troops moved inland, crouching low. Directly inland, the men found terraces which ascended toward a high plateau. 
grotesque limestone tombs have been built into the hillsides by the ancestor-worshipping Okinawans. These were potential hillboxes. With a beachhead established, the attack developed. Advancing over a patchwork of sweet potatoes, soybean, and rice fields, the troops neared Yontan Airfield. Amtrak's lent mobile support to the infantry. Resistance encountered during this phase was light and sporadic. It was quickly silenced by Marine fire teams and riflemen. By noon of Love Day, Yontan Airfield had been secured by the 4th Marines. The big airdrome was found essentially intact. Trapped in their revetments, enemy fighters had been destroyed by airstrikes. A master of deception, the enemy made use of dummies. This shadow-casting straw dummy had been a problem to air photo interpreters. The 6th Marine Division struck out from Yontan Airfield across the brilliant red-soiled expanse. East of Yontan Airfield, contact was made with small enemy holding forces. By L plus three, the Pacific had been reached and the battle for Ishikawa Isthmus had begun. Henceforth, the enemy would have tenacious allies. Space and time were on his side. For the division, success in the north would be measured in speed and distance, as well as by casualties inflicted on the enemy. Troops outflanked the Japanese on the coasts, while battalions of infantry spliced their way into the rugged interior to find the enemy and destroy him. Ferreting him out in the heavy, deceptive vegetation was difficult. Relentlessly efficient, fire teams worked their way into position and then methodically erased snipers. Second timing made it possible to seal the enemy in his caves before he cut you down. In the mountains of Ishikawa Isthmus, these dramatic sequences were filmed. Dazed and burned, the snipers survived the blast. First aid was administered, the prisoner was interrogated. Such interrogations revealed the locations of other snipers and the hunt went on. Along the coasts of the isthmus, the division was in full motion. By utilizing every vehicle, by improvisation and tireless energy, this infantry division moved with the speed of a motorized unit. The uninterrupted forward movement achieved by the division kept the enemy off balance. Obstacles on which the Japanese had so heavily depended were overcome by the combination of effective equipment and trained hands. Heavy rains turned the coastal flats into a morass, but this obstacle too was overcome. By noon of L plus six, elements of the 29th Marines entered Nago, principal northern town. After Nago was systematically searched and cleared, the division was prepared to undertake the conquest of the great northern segments of the island. with a tide in the coral reef, and success was measured in gross tonnage moved from ship to shore. The modern infantry division is a complex organism. It requires gas as well as guts to move, and for this division averaging more than five miles per day over diverse and difficult terrain, 
the problem of supply was acute. Assisted by the 58 CBs, the 6th engineers had labored to make Yontan Airfield operative. A Marine observation cub came in on L plus 2. This was the first American plane to land on Japanese home soil since the outbreak of war. Meanwhile, the 29th Marines were penetrating Motobu Peninsula against a progressively rising tempo of enemy resistance. Simultaneously, the 22nd Marines crossed the colorful broad expanse of northern Okinawa. By L plus 12, the 22nd Marines had reached rocky Heido Cape at the northern extremity of Okinawa. Now, only a segment of Motobu Peninsula remained to the Japanese in the 6th Marine Division zone of action. Advancing into Motobu Peninsula, the 29th Marines took the village of Unten on the north coast. Intelligence officers studied the unique enemy base at Unten. Here, midget submarines were moved over tracks to protective caves in the hills. Japanese suicide boats were found near Unten. These speedy craft carried explosive charges in their bows for suicide ramming missions. The main enemy force in the north, commanded by Colonel Udo, was emplaced in elaborate mountain defenses at Mount Yaitaki. The 29th Marines drove in the enemy's outposts. Casualties mounted as the enemy lashed back with artillery and mortars to prevent encirclement. Artillery of the 15th Marines pounded the Yaitaki defenses while the 29th Marines closed an iron ring around the enemy. Prior to the final assault, Colonel Alan Shapley took command in the Yaitaki sector. The Colonel briefed the officers of his reinforced 4th Regiment. Plans for the assault were received and checked by platoon leaders and NCOs. Final orders were issued. 81 millimeter mortars commenced a barrage against located enemy mountain positions. In these pictures, more living Japanese have been caught than in any others taken during the Pacific War. With mortar shells lobbing into their midst, more than 50 of the enemy came out of their holes to take up alternate positions. Artillery joined the concert of mortars, increasing the effect. The attacking Marines had come to close quarters with the enemy. This man had just been shot in the hand. With the corpsman at his heels, he took cover. Pressure was brought to bear on the enemy at the base of the mountain. Then the assault commenced. On L plus 14, the 4th Marines went over the top to engage in a bitter hand-to-hand -hand struggle for Yaitaki Peak. By nightfall, the enemy's last grip on northern Okinawa had been broken. Mount Yaitaki had its price. But Colonel Udo's entire Japanese garrison was annihilated. On the heels of the capture of Mount Yaitaki came the crushing news of President Roosevelt's death. A pall hung over Okinawa as over every isolated segment of land or sea where Americans fought their global war. At a joint memorial service, fighting men of the 6th Marine Division paid tribute to their fighting leader. Like the buddies they had lost at Mount Yaitaki, he too had been a casualty. Warned equally by men of all ranks, all creeds, all colors, Franklin Delano Roosevelt passed on. The faces of these mourners testify to the love which the departed president stirred in the hearts of his countrymen. The invading Marines brought more than fire and steel to Okinawa. They brought democracy. At Taira, an experiment was begun. A town council met under American guidance and proceeded to govern the people. Introduced to the democratic way of life, the Okinawan community flourished. Under Marine supervision, 
schools and medical facilities sprang up overnight. Working with the minimum of equipment, civil affairs personnel accomplished a miracle in northern Okinawa. From the time of its inception, Tyra received as many as 1,500 civilians a day. They came sick, disorganized, and despondent. Their pitifully few possessions destroyed. At Tyra, they were absorbed, given new impetus to live. At Tyra, they found promise, the promise of freedom from fear and want, and the promise of a new Okinawa. In contrast to the conquered and now quiet North, Southern Okinawa shuddered beneath the impact of two great contending forces. Lieutenant General Ushijima's 32nd Japanese Army was holding its powerful defense line with a force estimated at 50,000 men. The line was anchored on the west of the Asa River, contained the hill mass north of Shuri in the center, and was anchored on the east in the hill mass of Yonabaru. General Ushijima's Naha Shuri Yonabaru line was actually a series of cave defenses, closely coordinated and elaborately constructed. Whole coral hills have been carved hollow as far down as 50 feet beneath the surface of the earth. Each of these hills contained barracks, galleys, communication facilities, electricity and storage space. Each hill was a land battleship carved out of coral, impervious to artillery fire, naval gunfire or aerial bombardment. The Naha Shuri Yanabaru line was the most difficult single barrier to a ground offensive faced by American troops in the Pacific. While the 6th Marine Division was engaged in reducing the North, the 24th Corps had attacked the line, but had failed to secure a penetration. Action flared along the flaming coral ridges between the East China Sea and the Pacific, and casualties rose in the ranks of the attacking divisions. To maintain pressure on the enemy, Major General Geiger's 3rd Amphibious Corps was ordered to take up positions on the 10th Army right front. The 1st Marine Division moved into the lines during the first days of May. Orders for the commitment of the 6th Marine Division were received on 6 May after General Shepard's troops had moved to central Okinawa and awaited further orders. By the evening of 8 May, the division was in column of regiments, with the 22nd Marines in assault. On the left of the 6th Marine Division was the 1st Marine Division, and on the left of the 3rd Amphibious Corps was the 24th Corps. The 6th Marine Division's assault of the line was scheduled for the early hours of 10 May. The 22nd Marines were in position to cross the Asa River with the aid of the 6th Engineers, and to attack the enemy positions to the south. During the late afternoons of 9 May, the division sector looked ominously quiet. The brackish, stagnant Asa wound westward to the sea. South of the river, the terrain ascended abruptly toward a high coral hill mass. Under professional eyes, the Naha Shuri Yanabaru line looked tough. This line was the reason why Okinawa was the bloodiest of all the sanguinary operations fought for the mastery of the Pacific. In the morning, the 22nd Marines would attack with two battalions abreast and their right flank on the sea. lasting through dawn of 10 May, the infantry moved out past the Asa River. By 0800, the assault regiment had two battalions across the Asa, and the attack developed. A bridgehead of 1,400 yards was held under heavy enemy fire at the close of the first day. <laughs> Tanks rolled over the Asa on 11 May. They used a Bailey Bridge thrown up under fire during the night by the 6th Engineers.
Joining the assault battalions, the tanks increased the pressure against the enemy. The battle mounted in intensity and casualties rose. Naval corpsmen serving with the infantry ignored the death in the air to tend the wounded. Tanks and infantry attacked the enemy's coral forts near the coast. While further to the east, the battlefield shuddered under the impact of contending artillery. Enemy tank hunter teams, mines and artillery knocked our vehicles out of action. In this spectacular sequence, the crew abandoned one of our disabled tanks. A rescue tank approached to tow it to safety. The crew returned, using the rescue vehicle for cover. Under a hail of enemy small arms fire, the crew used phosphorus grenades to lay down a smoke screen. As the enemy strove to destroy both vehicles, the disabled tank moved off under its own power. In another corner of the battlefield, preparations were made to attack an enemy hill fortress. While tanks shelled the gun forts, infantry moved into position for an assault. Working in teams of three and four and utilizing cover and concealment, the infantry applied demolitions and flamethrowers to destroy the fort. On the morning of 13 May, the 22nd Marines drove up the last major escarpment before Naha. Troops following the highway were subjected to unrelenting enemy artillery fire. On 14 May, the last of the enemy were driven from the high ground. The camera caught them first. Then, one of our machine guns opened up. Marines of the 22nd Regiment now looked down on the ravaged city of Naha, sprawling desolately beneath them. Artillery commenced to bombard the city, directed by observers manning our OPs. ground lay a suburban village separated from Naha by the Asato River. Machine gunners applied direct fire against this target. Infantry worked its way down the reverse slope among the tombs on the hillside. Then infantry supported by tanks fought a brief bitter action for the suburb against enemy suicide groups entrenched in the rubble. After several hours, the 22nd Marines held the suburb, and with it, the north bank of the Asato at its mouth. Meanwhile, the battle shifted eastward. The 29th and 22nd Marines strove to reach the Asato River on a broad front to exploit the penetration already made into a breakthrough. Troops utilized the cover of the railroad. As the division advanced, its left flank grew extended and exposed. With all other parts of his line holding firm, the enemy strove to neutralize the gains made by the 6th Marine Division. All available weapons were brought to bear on the enemy. Rockets were effective. But the vulnerability of their carriers forced a hasty exit once their loads were discharged. Self-propelled artillery increased the weight of our firepower. In four days, 
the 22nd Marines had broken through at the Asa River and had reached the mouth of the Asato River. Before the Naha Shuri Yanabaru line could be broken, either by a wheeling movement toward Shuri or by a forward movement resulting in the outflanking of Shuri and the capture of Naha, it was necessary that the penetration be developed. Thus, the 22nd and 29th Marines, though menaced by an extended and vulnerable left flank, pressed forward to seize the north bank of the Asato. The enemy's resistance, abetted by his excellent observation and heavy volume of artillery fire from the Shuri Hill Mass, made progress difficult. At Sugarloaf Hill, the apex of a triangle formed by three small hills, the enemy was prepared to make a final stand in defense of his line. If he held Sugarloaf, the penetration would have been cauterized. If he failed to hold Sugarloaf, the line would be doomed and the 32nd Japanese Army would be forced to withdraw further south where it faced annihilation. Lieutenant General Buckner joined Major General Shepard to observe the 6th Marine Division zone of action. As these American field commanders studied an ugly mass of coral and volcanic ash called Sugarloaf Hill, so did Japanese generals Ushijima and Cho. Antagonists and protagonists agreed that Sugarloaf Hill was the key on Okinawa Jima. Between 14 May and 19 May, the 22nd and 29th Marines fought the Battle of Sugarloaf Hill. It was a battle unsurpassed in Marine Corps history for the strategic importance of its outcome, for its unrelenting bitterness, and for the lives it cost per foot of ground. The men rose out of the earth and moved toward the hill. They clambered over its barren thighs as enemy rifle and machine gun fire swept about them. Carefully, they worked toward the summit. Over the rim of the summit were hundreds of the enemy entrenched in caves. Less than 20 yards separated these Marines from the Japanese. Casualties were treated as the battle swirled about them. The story of Sugarloaf was indelibly written on the faces of the living and the dead. Driven off by massed enemy fire, the Marines came back for another assault. Sugarloaf Hill changed hands more than 11 times during the battle, costing the enemy an estimated seven battalions. Its price in Marines was heavy, too. During the 10-day period, our losses numbered 2,662 killed and wounded. In addition, the 29th and 22nd Marines suffered the loss of 1,289 men due to exhaustion and sickness. Back on the summit, the men dug in and fought to hang on in the face of devastating fire. On 18 May, the 29th Marines stood on the hill once again. This time, they had come to stay. Rising to unbelievable heights of courage, they would not be dislodged. By the morning of 19 May, Sugarloaf Hill was ours. Even after the battle, the shifting ash of Sugarloaf continued to reveal the dead. These Marines were identified and removed for burial. The 4th Marines went into the lines and drove toward the Asato River. They crossed this barrier and entered the eastern suburbs of Naha. The people called it the Reign of the Plum and it lasted 16 days and nights. It had rained throughout the battles at the Asa River and at Sugarloaf Hill, filling foxholes with stagnant water, making rivers of roads disrupting supply and communication. 
The rains closed all overland supply arteries. Amtrak's were called into service to haul food, ammunition, and medical equipment over the reef fringing Okinawa's west coast. Having reached the north bank of the Asato in strength, the division was now able to enter Naha, the prize of the Ryukyus. Complete familiarity with the technique of street fighting, emphasized by Major General Shepard in the training phase, now paid off. Fire teams infiltrated into the maze of rubble, systematically destroying enemy pockets and clearing the city of snipers. The veterans of the Solomons, the Marshals, the Marianas, who composed the 6th Marine Division, had kept the image of the city before them for more than 25 days of intensive battle. Most of them had not seen a city since they left the Golden Gate, and Naha, with its population of 65,000, had been the brightest star on their horizon. But the city they found was a graveyard. Its people had vanished with its buildings. Nothing lived in this desert of stone. An occasional arch remained upright. An occasional derelict poked its way upward from the carpet of rubble. As though by miracle, the city's two Christian churches were still standing. Only the front of Naha's movie theater was recognizable. Naha's antiquated rail yard were wrecked beyond repair. Bridges no longer span the Asato Canal. The 6th Marine Division did not pause and captured Naha. Troops poured through its streets and out into the countryside to the southeast where contact with the retreating enemy was being maintained. When their Naha Shuri Yanabaru line became untenable, as a result of the penetration made by the division at the Asa, followed by its victory at Sugarloaf Hill, the Japanese were forced to withdraw southward. Once out of his elaborate coral fortresses, the enemy was subjected to devastating artillery, air, and naval bombardment. Much of his equipment, personnel, and combat efficiency was lost on the roads during his withdrawal to the south. The Japanese formed a new line based at Yeju Daki Plateau and Mazaro Ridge, where they were to make their last stand. General Yushijima decided, however, to maintain his garrison on Oruku Peninsula for the following reasons. One, the enemy could deny us the use of Naha Harbor and Naha Airfield. The harbor was of particular value to the 10th Army because it meant shortened supply lines to the forces that would attack the Yeju Daki Mazado line. Two, by holding Oruku Peninsula, the enemy could maintain a threat to the rear of 10th Army forces attacking the Yeju Daki Mazado line. Three, because Oruku Peninsula was heavily fortified, the enemy assumed that weeks of sanguinary effort would be required to reduce it. And this was consistent with General Yushijima's avowed purpose of waging a battle of attrition on Okinawa. To the 6th Marine Division fell the mission of capturing Oruku Peninsula. The enemy watched the division advance toward the Kokuba River and girded himself for an attack from the east. Major General Shepard waited for the defenders of Oruku to dispose themselves on the east and then Masking his intentions, 
followed a plan that undoubtedly saved hundreds of marine lives and cost the enemy his strategic peninsula in less than two weeks. At dawn of 4 June, while the enemy awaited an attack from the east, the 4th Marines came ashore on the western beaches of Aruku Peninsula. Having capitalized on the maneuverability of his amphibious force and having achieved the element of surprise, General Shepard found the Oruku beaches lightly defended. The 4th Marines moved swiftly inland. As the light from the east grew brighter, supporting waves continued to come ashore to develop the beachhead. The surprised Japanese commander abandoned Naha airfield and attempted to cover it only by fire. Moving southeastward from the beach, the 4th Marines reached Naha Airfield on 4 June and secured it on the 5th. This had been the enemy's principal ferry base for aircraft headed southward from Japan. With the airfield behind them, the 4th Marines pushed northward to the high ground which the enemy was defending. The 29th and 22nd Marines were committed from the east and west respectively. Thus, by a series of rapid maneuvers, the formidable enemy garrison was reduced to a pocket under attack from three directions. Again, the enemy was defending a series of coordinated cave positions. Each fortified hill was overrun and liquidated, and then an adjacent hill came under fire prior to assault. The enemy struck back. Armed with a surplus of weapons, he inflicted casualties. Tanks were used to clear small valleys and ravines between hill forts. Troops moved quickly from hill to hill, for the low areas were covered by the enemy's automatic weapons. When an enemy hill was reached, the grim business of reducing each gun port and air vent by fire team action proceeded. Streams of fire poured into the ventilating system of a fort proved effective. Demolitions. In the hands of experts, TNT was a powerful weapon. It blew in vents, caved in gun ports, sealed entrances and exits. The enemy employed mines extensively, particularly in the coastal flats, roadbeds and on the airfield. Trained personnel cleared these areas. In addition to standard anti-personnel and anti-vehicular mines, the enemy used improvised tomato can mines. These were filled with picric acid and iron and steel fragments. During the closing days of the Peninsula Campaign, prisoners were taken. This Korean, taken from Admiral Ota's command post, had amputated a section of his own leg and managed to live. Driven from the high ground and trapped in the weeds, the enemy had two alternatives, to die or to surrender. The majority chose to die. But many surrendered, and in numbers that were, until that time, unprecedented in Pacific warfare. Victory at Oruku Peninsula meant the opening of the port of Naha. 
Dredging operations and reconstruction began immediately with the collapse of enemy resistance across the water. This Bailey Bridge was a monument to the labors of the 6th Engineer Battalion. It was the longest Bailey Bridge ever constructed by the Marine Corps. It spanned Naha Ko, linking Naha with Oruku Peninsula, and had been constructed under fire. The Battle of Okinawa went on. 10th Army Divisions attacking the Yeju Daki Mazado Line were making limited progress. The 6th Marine Division moved into the lines opposite Mazado Ridge. With the 22nd Marines in assault, the attack jumped off on 17 June. Mazado Ridge was a jagged pile of coral. The enemy, scarcely perceptible, defended it from caves and crevices. <coughs> But by late afternoon of 17 June, the 22nd Marines had taken the ridge and were pushing beyond its reverse slope. Kuwanga Ridge was the next hurdle. Now the Marines could smell the sea at the bottom of the island, the sea that spelled final victory on Okinawa. Behind a wall of fire, they pushed forward until they had crossed Kuwanga Ridge. The 4th and 29th Marines advanced across the last open field. Their lines moved relentlessly forward, pinning Japanese soldiers and Okinawan civilians against the sea. Flamethrower tanks set fire to the last patch of woods left to the enemy. On 21 June, the 6th Marine Division reached the cliff at the southernmost extremity of the island. But below the cliff, a disorganized and defiant enemy remained. Now the tremendous task of capturing or killing the remaining enemy and saving the thousands of helpless civilians began. From this gargantuan cave, where they had taken refuge, the division evacuated more than 600 Okinawan civilians. Burned, starved, desperate people poured out of this cave at the bottom of the island after weeks of confinement. Most of them were too weak to walk. Most of them could not adjust their eyes to the sunlight after living in darkness. After receiving emergency first aid, refugees were taken by truck to the civilian compound north of Itoman. Those who were able went by foot. Every day, thousands of them poured into the civilian compound. The division handled 24,308 civilians on southern Okinawa alone. Each of them needed food and medical attention. Each of them needed to be screened and organized. Pitiful spectacle. This family typified the condition of the people. Medical personnel worked incessantly. There was little time for sentiment. There were not enough hours in the day to repair these broken people. Indomitable Okinawans won the respect of their conquerors. Stoically, they adjusted themselves to their terrible situation, helping themselves wherever possible. Not even the children cried. For the able-bodied males, there was work to be done. 
After they were screened by counterintelligence, the men were organized for labor on the roads and in the field. Equally as spectacular and more significant was the haul of Japanese prisoners taken simultaneously from the bottom of the island. Surrender leaflets fired into the enemy's lines by artillery, coupled with other propaganda warfare methods, brought unprecedented results. The 6th Marine Division took 3,254 prisoners on Okinawa, the largest number ever taken by a Marine Division in the Pacific War. The Okinawan people watched the miserable remnants of General Yushijima's 32nd Army trot back to the prisoner of war stockade. The legend of Japanese invincibility was for them eternally broken. Docile and beaten, they climbed into trucks that bore them to the prisoner of war stockade near the division command post. Here they found plenty of silent, beaten company. Each man was searched by trained military police. Each man was interrogated by Japanese language officers, and the information received was checked by order of battle officers and forwarded to higher echelon. At the prisoner of war stockade, there were facial studies for the camera to record. Each face spoke without moving its lips. Each face was eloquent. They spoke of defeat, of despair, of disillusion. These were young faces and old, tired, bitter faces, sullen faces that won another chance. But all were the faces of a defeated people. The 6th Marine Division raised the stars and stripes for the second time on Okinawa Jima. They had raised the flag over the north, now they raised it over the southernmost extremity of the strategic island. The 6th Marine Division left the best part of itself on Okinawa Jima. But with its heroic dead, it left a record worthy of them and of the United States Marine Corps. The 6th Marine Division captured more than 75% of the total area of Okinawa Jima. It captured the two principal airfields on the island. This division captured the city of Naha, largest ever taken by the United States Marine Corps and the first city to be wrested from the Japanese Empire. This was the division victorious at Mount Yahitaki that won the critical battle of the operation at Sugarloaf Hill. The 6th Marine Division killed 23,000 Japanese and captured more than 3,500 a record unsurpassed. The enemy called the 6th the Tiger Cub, called it the American division that could break up the battle for Okinawa. The enemy was right. The 6th Marine Division suffered 8,227 battle casualties on Okinawa Jima. 1,622 of these I buried near the East China Sea. These were men who died on the fringe of the atomic age. These were men who had fought the enemy from the beginning, in the jungle and on the atolls of the broad Pacific, and who had died fighting him on his own soil. These were men who never doubted and never knew the outcome. A day was set aside for those who fell. At a formal ceremony, they were honored by those of their fellows who had survived them. The chaplain prayed for them. The division commander humbly thanked them. Then, their friends bid them a last silent goodbye. God 
and country. Twenty-five hundred yards. Behind the reef that girdled the island lay hundreds of miles of unbroken rocky coastline. Naha, once a prosperous port city of 65,000 people, this city has become a constant target and heavily populated. Here, the terrain was undulating and contained small coral hillocks. In central Okinawa, the terrain grew irregular. Wooded foothills, escarpments, and terraces replaced the level country. In the north, mountains rose out of the sea to form a virtually unbroken spine in the interior. On overcrowded, impoverished Okinawa, the people carved their terraces over whole mountains in a desperate effort to exist. Aerial reconnaissance indicated that in the coming operation, space would be an ally of the Japanese. To the United States, the enemy's principal fighter base on the island was the primary objective of the 6th Marine Division. Located on a high plateau less than 2,000 yards inland from the beach, Yantan Airfield would be required as a base for daylight and night fighter marine aviation. Easter Sunday, 1 April 1945, was the day of the landing. It was designated as Love Day. Under ideal sea conditions and covered by naval gunfire, assault battalions of the 4th and 22nd Marines headed for the beaches of Okinawa. Veterans of Macon, Tulagi, Guadalcanal, New Georgia, Bougainville, Emera, Eniwetok, and Guam, these Marines had just completed months of extensive amphibious training in the Lower Solomons. While Colonel Merlin Schneider's 22nd Marines moved shoreward toward the green beaches, Colonel Allen Chapley's 4th Marines headed for the red beaches from which they could directly assault Yontan Air. The state's 10th Army, commanded by Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner, went the mission of landing on and seizing Okinawa Jima. Organized prior to the operation, the 10th Army was composed of the 24th Corps and the 3rd Marine Amphibious Corps. Comprising the 3rd Marine Amphibious Corps was Major General Lemuel C. Shepard, Jr.'s 6th Marine Division, Major General Pedro Del Valle's 1st Marine Division, and Corps troops. The plan for the initial landing of the 10th Army was as follows. The 6th Marine Division was to land on the green and red beaches, which extended generally from a point north of Sobe Town to Zapamasaki. The 1st Marine Division was to land on the right of the 6th Marine Division, between Sobe Town and the Bisha River. The 24th Corps was to land on the right of the 1st Marine Division, south of the Bisha River. Yontan Airfield. <laughs> Okinawa Jima was the scene of the last great battle of the Pacific War. The capital and nucleus of the bead-like Ryukyu chain, Okinawa was only 495 miles from the coast of China, 380 miles from Formosa, and 415 miles from Kyushu. It screened the East China Sea, insulated the teeming coastal cities of China, and it was the lock on Japan's southern door. A vital link in the imperial mechanism, Okinawa was the funnel through which the enemy fed and reinforced his embattled fortresses to the south. Japanese aircraft, merchantmen, and fleet units paused at Okinawa's airfields and harbors en route to South China, Malaya, the Indies, and the Carolines. Okinawa and the Ryukyus was the Japanese jugular vein. In American hands, Okinawa would represent the first conquest of Japanese home soil for this island was an imperial prefecture. In American hands, Okinawa would mean the reduction of Japan from a powerful empire to an isolated land awaiting the shock of invasion. In January and February 1945, carriers of the United States Navy probed the waters of the East China Sea, launching strike after strike against the Ryukyus. Okinawa was the principal target for cameras as well as bombs. 
off okinawa a fringing reef extended seaward in some places to a distance of